There are many of us who adore corvids, those intelligent beautiful birds who, although associated with darkness sometimes and the macabre often, we still love and hold in great esteem. These birds are so intelligent, there are many studies being carried out globally to find out just how clever are corvids, and every time the findings continue to astound us. I will create another video of some more of the corvid species, but today let us concentrate on some of the folklore surrounding three of these noble birds, the crows, the rooks and the ravens. The crow is probably the most recognisable of the corvid family. Glossy black feathers tinted with colour, bright and clever eyes and that very commonly heard cawing and croaking sound. They have been alongside humans for so long a time that we don't even recall when they weren't a part of our life and our folklore. They are supreme scavengers, as we humans are, and so it is obvious that they would hang around with us. And yet our relationship with them is a love-hate thing, as it is with all corvids, maybe because they remind us so much of ourselves. They are extremely intelligent, they will even remember people or traps that are a threat and teach the other flock members to recognise them. They use tools and will give gifts to humans in exchange for food, loyal to their flock and family, and are also monogamous. And yet, they are a crafty bird, clever, they will prey on anything to survive, especially the weak. To judge them is to judge ourselves. Let us look at some of the folklore surrounding these beautiful birds. The collective name for crows is a murder, and these clever birds are regarded as tricksters in many world mythologies and are associated with magic, death and the other world. In Celtic mythology, the warrior goddess, the Morrigan, often appeared on battlefields as a crow, sometimes known as a raven, accompanied by more of her flock, picking over the corpses of the fallen dead for food. If crows appear in threes, it is said that the Morrigan is close by, and this harks back to the sacred number three, which appears many times in folklore and mythology. Morrigan is an aspect of the triple goddess, the number three. Crows were believed to be guides leading the souls of the dead to the next world, the other world. The Morrigan encountered the hero Cuchulain on the battlefield. He was mortally wounded, but in defiance, wanting to die on his feet, he tied himself to a great rock. In her guise as a crow, the Morrigan landed on his shoulder, thus showing all around that he had passed to the other world. It is probably the crow's feasting on the flesh of the dead after the bloody battles of our ancestors that began their association with darkness, the other world and death, a slightly revolted fascination and respect for them. In ancient Greece, the crow and the raven were a symbol of Apollo in his guise of the god of prophecy. As such, a crow flying from the east or the south was considered lucky. There is a lovely Polish fairy tale that tells of a king who has three daughters. There's that magical number again. The youngest daughter was the prettiest of the three. One day, this princess found an injured crow in the garden of a ruined castle. She pitied the poor bird and went to tend to it. The crow, seeing her kindness, tells her he is really a bewitched prince. He must live as a crow for seven years, another magical number. 
He tells her that his spell can be broken if she agrees to live in the one remaining room that still exists in the tumbled down and ruined castle. She must sleep on the golden bed each night and never make a single sound no matter what happens. However, should she fail, his torture will be twice as harsh. The brave princess agrees, but each night evil ghosts appear and threaten her, frighten her until the cold light of dawn and torment her. But being a brave princess, she remains silent. Not a sound leaves her lips. One of her other three sisters tries to help by offering to stay with her until dawn. And yet the older princess was terrified. The youngest princess decided she must complete the task on her own. Each morning she finds the enchanted crow and tells her that he is much better than he was the day before. Two long years pass in this way until one day the crow tells her that she has a final task. To break the spell, she must carry out work as a servant for one full year. She finds such work, but her new master treats her brutally. Still though, the brave princess carries on, keeping her word to the crow prince. At the end of this year, she and the crow find each other once more. The prince returns to his beautiful human form, and of course, as in all fairy tales, the two fall in love. They marry and return to the ruined castle, which is a ruin no more, but is now a magnificent fine castle where they live the rest of their days. There is a similar folk tale in the West Highlands of Scotland where there are many crow fireside stories. One is of the Hoodie Crow. The youngest of three sisters takes it upon herself to marry a crow. Once married, the crow is discovered to also be a bewitched, handsome young man. Thanks to her love of the crow man, the spell begins to dissipate over time and she has a drastic choice to make. She chooses that her husband will be a man during the day and a crow during the night. Did she choose wisely? In the northeast of Scotland, crows were associated with dark magic and magicians who dabbled in the darker magical arts. If they landed on your home, they heralded a death in the household it seems that as the land became more Christianized, the Celtic crow began to be seen as a bird of evil omen, associated with witches, darkness, the macabre and death, rather than a natural progression of life. And yet, we are still fascinated by these beautiful intelligent birds, and who can blame us? To look at a crow is to look into the eyes of ourselves. The rook is distinguishable from other corvids by the bare, creepy, pale skin in front of the eyes where the skull meets the bird's bill, an adaptation perfectly suited to their love of hunting worms and reminiscent of the plague doctor masks of the Middle Ages. They are mainly a countryside bird. These beautiful but strange looking creatures have a diet of mainly worms and grain, insects, small creatures, and like all other corvids, carrion, the flesh of the dead. Because of this, farmers have a somewhat love-hate relationship with rooks as they flock in great numbers across the fields. Although, they can be beneficial to the farmer, as they will also prey on the grubs of insects that will destroy crops. The traditional scarecrow was really built to frighten away rooks. They should actually be known as scare rooks. They live in huge colonies set in treetops, which then become known as rookeries. Nothing can sound so haunting as the calling and calling of rooks in winter and autumn fall 
as they cry plaintively across the cold fields to each other, calling each other home as sunsets, calling to stray birds. Because of the large close-knit groupings and complicated structure of rooks' lives, and they often negative folkloric association with the birds, the name rookery, or rookeries, was also adopted for the very dangerous areas of overcrowded and crime-ridden 19th century East End of London. The collective name for a group of rooks is a parliament, and it is said that rooks will gather to judge those who have been betraying their familial group, stealing twigs maybe from other rooks' nests. The parliaments meet to judge and sentence the transgressor. The familial group balance is all important to the rook. This judgment of the rooks could also be heaped upon humans around Easter time. It was believed that the birds would poop on those not dressed smart enough for Easter celebrations. Better get out that Easter bonnet in spring. It is believed that rooks can also predict weather changes. If they build their nests high in the trees, this predicts a fine and bountiful summer. But find them building lower down, and a harsh summer full of rain and wind will happen. In the county of Devon in southwest England, it is believed that if rooks stay near or in their nests at midday, or if they return to the rookery early in the evening, rain was coming. However, if they flew far to hunt and feed, then it would be fine all of that day. In Yorkshire, in the north of England, it was said that rooks perching on dead branches predicted rain before nightfall. Perching on live branches predicted dry weather. Rooks were also known as harbingers of doom. If a rookery was abandoned by the Parliament, it is believed that this heralded bad fortune for the owners of the land upon which the rooks had been living, maybe even the death of the landowner. Likewise, a new rookery being established may bring bad luck to the family who owned that land. I guess we humans just can't win. However, if you have a rookery on your land that is happy and the parliament is content and stable, these birds will always bring good fortune to those who own the land. So finally, a truly happy ending for these noble birds. The raven, the largest of the corvids, with their throaty deep voices unmistakable, a sound almost like crack, crack, echoing over the moors, fields, empty land and places of solitude. These magnificent birds aren't just clever, they are big. When you find one close up, you cannot help but be impressed by their quiet power. Or their incredibly deep eyes, eyes that seem to look right into your soul. And yet, despite their dark associations, and their huge size, they can be as comical as the crow, as cheeky as the rook. These birds are real characters. Ravens also have a very peculiar group name, an unkindness of ravens. How supremely dramatic. I presume the collective name came about because of the negative associations of ravens in many cultures. These beautiful birds have a link to magic, particularly shape-shifting, spell-casting and occult hidden knowledge. Ravens mate for life, they have long lives too, and due to this they can also symbolise affection, wisdom, long life, fertility and death, which is probably due to their love of eating carrion, as all corvids do. Celtic belief had it that ravens were messengers, informers and watchers. 
Celtic mythology has many examples of flocks of ravens and also single birds in this role. Of course, Norse belief and lore also features ravens as integral to their religious culture. The great god Odin has two companion ravens, Hugin, thought, and Munin, memory. These divine birds would travel the world collecting information and then returning to sit on each of his shoulders so that they could whisper their knowledge and wisdom into Odin's ears. The warrior warlike daughters of Odin, the Valkyries, would sometimes transform themselves into ravens in echoes of the folklore of the Morrigan. Another Norse hero, Flocky, became known as Raven Flocky after an adventure that took him and his family and companions to Iceland. They had begun their voyage in Norway, onto the Shetland Isles in Scotland, where one of his daughters sadly drowned. Onwards the travellers sailed to the Faroe Isles, where another daughter was married. From here he took three captive ravens. These he planned to help him find Iceland. They continued on their epic voyage. After setting sail from the Faroes, Flocky released the ravens. The first returned to the Faroe Isles. The second returned to the boat. But the third flew high and strong to the west, which Flocky and his companions saw as a sign that land was close by. They followed the raven's flight and of course found what Flocky would name as Iceland and that is how Flocky became Raven Flocky. In the Celtic country of Wales we find that ravens symbolise protection and prophecy and yet in other Celtic nations there is a more negative association to the goddess Morrigan that we have spoken of before the goddess of battle, war, warriors and also sexuality. She could transform into a raven or a crow and would pick across the battlefields after war, eating the fallen dead and it was believed acting as a guide for their spirits to the other world, similar to the role of Odin and his ravens after battles. The Banshee of Ireland is believed to be able to shapeshift into a raven. Should one call as it flies over your home, it can foretell of the death of one inside the house. Morgan Le Fay of the Arthurian legends had the raven as her talisman. Being the queen of the fairies, she was also known as the queen of the Dushi, and it was these dark fairies who were tricksters taking the forms of flocks of ravens. The noble raven, with its connection to the gods and the goddesses, and as a protector, is seen as a talisman of protection in London, in the United Kingdom, at the Tower of London, where a small group of at least six ravens has been kept for centuries, living in the courtyard, cared for by the raven master. The folklore says that should the ravens leave the tower it will fall and so will the monarchy, the ruling king or queen. The earliest legend that seems to explain this folklore is a Welsh tale of the war between Bran the Blessed, the king of the Britons, and the Irish lord Matholoc, who had mistreated Branwen, Bran's sister. After the battle, Bran ordered that his own head be cut off and buried beneath the White Hill, where the Tower of London was built under the reign of William the Conqueror. This way Bran could protect the land for all time, and also all within it. Bran was associated with the raven, and indeed Bran is today the modern Welsh word for the raven, and so it seems most likely that the head of Bran the Blessed buried beneath the tower is the link to the legend of the ravens keeping the tower safe. Another Welsh hero, Owen, had a flock of ravens full of magical arts that he would order to attack during battle. Welsh witches, 
were also known to be able to transform into ravens. In biblical folklore, ravens were sent out to test for land by Noah. Of course, the ravens found many corpses to feast on because of the great flood when they found land, and so they did not return to the ark, but stayed to eat. Sadly, in Christian tradition, this cast a negative light on the bird, portrayed as greedy, selfish, a mean creature, arrogant and only interested in itself. It actually sounds a lot like some people I have met. Ravens and all of their symbolism have often been popular plot devices for artists, writers and poets. Muses. They are spoken of in the Anglo-Saxon prose Beowulf. Shakespeare's Lady Macbeth speaks of the raven as a portent of doom and death. And of course we have Edgar Allan Poe with his gothically romantic poem The Raven. Then this ebony bird beguiling my sad fancy into smiling by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore. Though thy crest be shorn and shaven, thou, I said, art sure no craven, ghastly grim and ancient raven wandering from the nightly shore. Tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's plutonian shore, quoth the raven, nevermore. The noble raven appears in the folklore of almost all cultures and countries around the world and I have only chosen the smallest amount to tell you of here. They feature in stories, poems, art, songs, on heraldic crests and shields and in too many legends and folklore to mention. It would seem that these amazing birds have been an integral part of our human culture for as long as we have noticed them, respected them and honoured them, also slightly fearing them, but always noticing their presence in our midst. And so there we have tales and lore of just three birds of the Corvid family and some of their folklore. I will make another homage to more of these incredibly beautiful intelligent birds another time. They are all very beautiful, very fascinating as well. The jays, also jackdaws. But for now, I really hope that you enjoyed this time we spent together sharing a little folklore about these stunning birds. As I always say, I really love sharing my research and passions with you. Um, Mark and I are both birders, Mark much, much more than me, with his working nature conservation as well. So let me know in the comments if there is a particular fairy creature or an animal or a bird or a plant or a tree you would like to see a video of. Do you have stories or folklore that you know of to do with crows, rooks and ravens? If you have enjoyed this video, please hit like and subscribe and hit the little bell symbol too so you get notifications of our next instalment. Until next time, dear friends, keep well, brightest of blessings and remember, don't play with the fairy folk or you may end up in one of my folk tales yourself.